Hey, what's up, everybody? Luke Garrity here, the Sacramental Charismatic, and we are jumping into another episode. Uh, and I'm really, really pumped about this conversation that we're going to have because my friend Donnell is about the most gangster person I know. And uh, and by gangster, I mean he's in Michigan and he's probably a Lions fan. And uh, I got beat up by a dude who was wearing a Lions jacket once. And uh, so it's probably someone he knows. Anyway, Donnell, dude, thanks for being up on the, uh, on the podcast. Oh, I'm glad to be here, though. Like, I, I'm not sure about that opening. So, like, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to do everything I can to get the D- Donnell just to, like, you know, be – be very aggressive you want to be provocative is that it okay <laughs> yeah exactly i told i had all these ideas for for this episode but none of them work hey but uh, on a serious level uh donnell uh, I've, i think i've known you for uh at least 10 years probably something like that and you're a vineyard pastor in ann arbor michigan um and i you know you've also you're active on social media you have you're a brilliant thinker um, I've heard numerous papers you've presented at the Society for Vineyard Scholars or the Society of Vineyard Scholars, or I don't know the technical name, but SVS. And I've loved reading everything you've done. Um, but in addition to those things, you know, what are some things that you would want our listeners and viewers to know about you that would help them understand maybe a little bit more about, about who you are? Oh, that's a great question. I wasn't sure where you were going with that. It's like all that flattery to set me up for something else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's later, man. That's later. Because <laughs> I was like, really? You've you've actually read my papers at SBS? Okay. So did you um, not think I could read? Is that what this is? I <laughs> see how it is, man. That's not cool. So, so um, I think uh, something that I I want folks to know is I grew up in the inner city of Washington D.C. And I grew up uh, in a, a part of the city, uh, Ward 7 and 8, uh, called Southeast or Anacostia. And um, it, was, it was just a really interesting time because it was right during the crack epidemic, lots of stuff that was happening in the city. It was the murder capital of the nation at that time. Wow. Um, and, you know, you're, you're growing up in these sort of the places, the social um, locations that you find yourself in, and your world is just your world, right? And so you're navigating your world as best you can. And I've had some opportunities that were provided to me as uh, someone who was growing up in what I would describe as abject poverty. Mm-hmm. And one of those things was I, I'm the recipient of the I Have a Dream Foundation scholarship that was started by Eugene Lang out of New York. Wow. And he has uh, connections with Swarthmore College and so forth. And um, we had a, a regional owner of Century 21 Real Estate. And they, the, the owner, George uh, F. Kettle, he sponsored a sixth grade class. And I wasn't in the original class. So I actually, the, the original class just got their scholarship because he picked the okay. class. When I showed up in seventh grade, I, there were 13 slots that were available and I had to compete uh, to get in. And, and then I got in. And that one little interaction changed my entire life. And when you go back to his origin story, George's, uh, George Kettle's story, he will tell you he had a conversation with God. And he said to God something along the lines of, I want to do something that's meaningful with my life and with my money. And God said, well, put some money aside. So he created, this is the story he tells us. He creates account. He calls it God's account. The bank's like, you can't name it that. And he's like, that's what I'm going to name it. And he starts. He's like, yes, I can. It's my money. (laughs) Yeah, it's my money. (laughs) If if capitalism does anything, it tells people like how how to live in the world. (laughs) And um, and he and I, you know, it, it, it there's a huge power dynamic when you have a poor kid from the inner city who's being saved by a rich white man from suburban Virginia. And how do you have equality in that kind of conversation? How do you have parity uh, in that? But you learn things really quickly, right? Like, oh, I am helping you. So you should help me (laughs) in in these types of uh, environments. But his connection to faith, the I wasn't supposed to go to the middle school that I attended. So like I chose, like there was a neighborhood middle school that I was supposed to go to. And I was like, I don't want to go to that one. I'm going to go to this one. So I walked my whatever, 11, 12, 13 year old self, probably 11 or 12 uh, Mm -hmm. there. Guidance counselors like, you're not supposed to be here. And I was like, 
well, let's work on it. So yeah. she <laughs> did the transfer papers, transferred me over. And, and that just changed my whole life. Like wow. that little thing changed my life. And so one of the things that I, I want people to know about me is um, I think it's vitally important for us to center our faith in the communities uh, that we serve and interact with so that we can contribute to the common good. Mm. And, um, and I think there are things that everybody at every level can do that has a positive demonstrative impact on someone else's life. Um, and I'm a living witness of that. And so mm -hmm. I want, you know, the, the whole idea of each one teaches one, and I want to carry that forward. So liberation is a huge part of my narrative. So that's, mm -hmm. I was telling that backstory to get to liberation. Yeah. And I wow. see liberation as centered in the gospel. I think Jesus gets up in the synagogue in Luke four, mm -hmm. and he unrolls the scroll from Isaiah and he reads and he just, he says, look, this is a story about liberation and I'm here to announce God's liberation. And then he goes on to demonstrate it. And people have a problem. They have a huge fundamental problem because uh, people who are held in bondage, don't often see that their bondage is tied up to the bondage of other people. So mm -hmm. they think, and you see this and how people react, right, to Jesus. Yeah. Uh, he, he announces this and they don't say, okay, where's your ministry sign up? Like, how can I follow you? Like, where, where do I need to give money? No, they try to kill dude. They like try to mm -hmm. push him off a cliff <laughs> yeah. because they're like, wait, if you're liberating them, what about me? And the problem that they fail to see is that the liberation of those who are held in bondage also leads to their liberation. Wow. Um, and so that that's a huge that's a huge part. And I it, it's taken me, you know, I'm 45 um, years old. I know I only look 22 uh, when whenever I get in these conversations. People are like, "How how old are you?" Hi, little and, Sonny. <laughs> I know, I right? Pinch, I just want to pinch your cheek. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Like, I'm 45, and then, yo. <laughs> yeah. And then I tell them how long I've been in ministry. You know, I was like, I've been ministry. This is my 21st year, or mm. yeah, yeah, I'm in my 21st year of pastoring. And people are like. When did you get started? I was like at 12, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like uh, I've been funny. doing this a long time. Yeah, but yeah. Um, everything that I do now, and it took me a long time. It probably took the last eight years of my life before mm -hmm. I really, really understood what I think the gospel is about, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think I thought the gospel I had a narrative that I had inherited from my authoritative interpreters, which I then internalized and worked mm -hmm. into my ministry uh, sort of posture. And it, it it hasn't been probably eight years that I really understood what God is wanting to do um, in the gospel. And it's that I would get free, that you would get free, and mm -hmm. that together we would free other people. Like that, yeah. that is what God is like really, really, really interested in. So that's, mm -hmm. that's probably what I would love for people to know. I love that story. Uh, I, cause I, when I think of you <laughs> and I do often, uh, I, I think of, I mean, the word that really does come up for me, and I mean, this is, I, I really do believe this is true about you is, is the word determination. <clears throat> yeah. Like, I just, I mean, everything I, I mean, I, I like, I could say I love Donnell because I just have appreciated so much of what you've contributed to my own. I mean, just being selfish here, just my oh, own sure. life. Yeah. Cause it's all, it's all about me basically. What I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to say. But, uh, <laughs> no, I was kidding. But like, just also what you've brought to the table for the church tradition that we're a part of, um, yeah. you know, the vineyard movement. And then I think just, uh, outside of, you know, I mean, outside of the vineyard, just the, I don't know, quote unquote, charismatic evangelical ish. Mm -hmm jellyfish yep. whatever we are um so I, I that word determination always comes to mind when i think about you and so it's it's interesting how even as a middle schooler you were so determined you were like i'm not going to this school <laughs> i'm gonna walk that's crazy yeah. Yeah. No, it is and that, it is and and that that oh that actually uh ended up shaping the course of your life that you you, you were saying so 
Uh, and, and I think determination has obviously been a big part of your, you know, your life experience as a pastor too, which we're probably not going to go into all that craziness. I know. I was like, you didn't mention we were going to talk uh, about that. I, you know, I was like, well, I that'll, my own that'll stories be, about Luke. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, moving on, moving on. I cannot let people know <laughs> my involvement in any of those things, but, uh, but determine what are you talking about, <laughs> but determination is really good. Uh, you know, a really good characteristic in virtue in virtue. I think it's actually, um, you know, a significant, um, part of, of your story. And, and that's something I really appreciate, but you use the word liberation. Mm-hmm. And so something I've, um, I, I can't say like, um, I remember every single paper argument you've sure. made, but I do know that liberation theology is has been a prominent feature in yeah. um, your in your work. And I like I don't feel like I, I've read a fair amount of liberation theology from you know the alleged you know mostly South American and Central American theologians mm-hmm. who have yep. kind of been leading that charge for a long time, uh, specifically like Roman Catholic liberation theologians. Yes. Uh, and then I have a huge value for Moltmann. Like mm-hmm. Jürgen Moltmann is mm-hmm. probably one of my top three theologians. And I, I, I've, I've been fascinated by this German Protestant, you know, systematic theologian who's so fascinated by um, Pentecostal theologians. I mean, he's mm-hmm. interacted a lot with them, but also with liberation theology. And I think... Um, it's because his theology of of um, hope and his his work on the cross is so connected to the liberation theology that's been articulated by by like the global south. Um, what are your thoughts on Moltmann? Because I think you've read a little bit of him, um, from what I understand, and uh, you've, you've you've seen kind of that cross pollination between some of those thinkers. Um, and like I, maybe for our listeners and viewers, like a, what do you think about Moltmann? Because I want to know if we can be friends. And then second of all. I'd love to know how uh, how liberation theology, like what are the strengths of it? What are some of the critiques you might have of it? What are some of the questions you're still working through uh, on that topic? Oh, that's a lot. Okay. I didn't know we were going there. We okay, have four hours. You said. Yeah, I know. So, uh, <laughs> I know. Like, here we go. So let's start with Moltmann. Um, you're right. I've read a little. Uh, so mostly experiences in theology, the ways mm-hmm. and forms of Christian theology. Great and um, you know, I think I think the thing that I am I've been wrestling with. So, so I'm, I, I'm a fan. Okay. I wouldn't, mm-hmm. I wouldn't put him in my top three, but I'm, I'm a fan. So I'm I'll, sorry. I'll allow that. <laughs> well, I know John Calvin's your number one. So oh, I mean, as yeah, long as Calvin's your number one, you know, actually, I'm can we clarify? It's not. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure everybody knows that Donnell's favorite theologian is not John Calvin. Cause I'm afraid I'll probably have somebody tweet. So, no, no, there's there there's no way in hell uh, that <laughs> Calvin is my number one view. Move on, but, but Move that on. might mean I'm going to hell. So depending on, I'll, how let, this you, all, I'll let you know what I what I uh, determine okay. at the end of this. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Have I been predestined? Double predestined? <laughs> Triple oh, predestined? <laughs> look at you! Look at you using your reformed your reformed words. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm black. I got to read everything that black people write and everything that white people write so that I can be conversant <laughs> can, when so we can, have a conversation. <laughs> so you can also refute everything across yes. the board. Yeah, yes. got you. So, so yeah, I like Moltmann. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of the big things that he says is oppression is always a crime against life. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's not his original idea that that no. comes from the very voice of God. When we mm-hmm. turn over to the Exodus. Right. God looks at the world. Pharaoh. And 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 I tend to talk about systems of oppression as being pharaohs. Right. They're mm-hmm. these these godlike um, figures that are present in our lives and they have a narrative. They have a way of seeing the world. And so God says to Pharaoh, there is enough in my world. Pharaoh says back to God, no, there's not. And so that sets up sort of this thing that unfolds in the liberation of God's people. And one of the key things in the Exodus story that, you know, I've read that story I, you know, as pastors, we read, we read, we read, we read, right? So I don't want to overstate and say I've read it a thousand times, but let's just like lowball it. Say yeah. I've read it 50 times, okay? I mean, let's also say it's a significant <laughs> narrative in the in the theology of the church. Okay. Like, the Exodus so, is big, yeah. 
Yeah, so I've read that story at least 50 times. Do you know what I missed until I read it again in the last three years? Is I missed that I had only made the story about the people of Israel. So the descendants of Israel were the ones who were leaving captivity. But there's a one little line in the story that says, everybody leaves who wants the freedom that God is offering. And that was a key like moment for me, mm. right? Because what God was doing wasn't just protecting the people of Israel. He was mm -hmm. saying, this is a, a system of oppression. And if anybody else wants to leave this system of oppression, you too can leave. Now, we would say, anybody hearing me talk right now would say, well, of course, you know, the Egyptians who wanted to convert could have left. The people who were willing to follow Moses would have left. And, and I'm like, sure, let, that might be a little revisionist. We might be reading something mm -hmm. back in because remember the law is not even given yet. You yeah. know? They're, just, they're just going on stories, but it's mm -hmm. that everybody gets to leave. And when we begin to tell that story that God's liberation is for everybody, mm -hmm then to me, then liberation is a God authored story. Yeah, That's wow. not a story that I invented because I'm in an oppressed people group in a racialized system that uses a caste system to say, my life matters a little bit less than your life, you mm -hmm. know? And so that's not my invention. This is God's invention. He looks yeah. out at his world as, um, Who's our uh, favorite? Oh gosh, prophetic, uh, prophetic imagination guy. Because um, we're talking There's about a lot Bergman. of prophets. Oh, I know, but uh, the guy that Bergman. Wrote the book. Walter yeah, Bruggeman. Yeah, yeah, Bruggeman. Okay. Sorry, thank okay. you. I, I, I you mean it. you mean prophecy in a different word <laughs> yes, yeah. than no, no, no. crazy Not charismatic prophecy? Yeah. You know, I was Not like the Seven Hills. <laughs> I was like, John Hell's <laughs> about to go in. Yeah. Yeah, there's so, the prophetic so, so, imagination. Yeah. Yeah. So Brueggemann, Brueggemann is huge on abundance, right? Mm -hmm. He looks out at the world and he says, scarcity mm -hmm. is a lie. It's a lie's lie, right? And so what God is doing with God's people is saying to us that we are called to live in abundance. How do we get there? It's through liberation. We have to do what Paul says in Roman. We have to renew our mind, but we also have to live within a worldview of abundance. That's mm -hmm. what liberation theology for me is about, right? It's picking up a narrative that God starts mm -hmm. and it's continuing that narrative into my ministry, my gospel presentation today. Yeah. So of course there when are you, lots of, go ahead. When you think about like continuing the ministry of Jesus, which is really popular in our, in our circles, um, which I've, I've always looked at Luke four, like Luke four yeah. is the place where I'm like, this is the launching out of his mission, you know, the mission of God. Um, but it, it is interesting how um, a lot of times Christians tie it just to like preaching the message of the gospel, which is then um, articulated in a very narrow sense to to simplify that. And then also it might be like healing the sick and, you know, praying for people and doing charismatic stuff. But it is interesting how liberation is such a prominent feature of that that text, which goes back to Isaiah um, with your concept of liberation and the Exodus story, how do you think that might be? I was just thinking about this. How it ties back to the Abrahamic covenant in a sense too, of like it's a blessing. blessing, be a blessing. It's yeah, a like blessing. yeah, yes. yeah. It's and, not just like, for the Abra It's not just for the um, descendants of Abraham. It's actually a blessing for the whole entire world. Yes, that the Lord wants the entire mm. world to live in the abundance, and He's picked mm. a group of people to demonstrate what that abundance and fidelity looks like. And He says, "Look, I'm going to lavish this on you, so that you can lavish this on others." But we mm. always distort that narrative, right? I get a gift, like I talked about, the I Have a Dream Foundation scholarship, and I mm -hmm. say, "Well, God saw fit to pluck me out." from amongst you know the thousands of students in my public school district to bless this thing on me. And so now I hold that as this uh, special honor. And I don't look at that to say, well, what if God is asking me 
to use what he has equipped me with in order to carry forward this message of blessing mm -hmm. and liberation, right? Mm -hmm. And then to pick up Evil. where you were in yeah. Luke 4, jump over to John 8, right? He's interacting mm -hmm. with the woman caught in adultery. We read that mm -hmm. story in a lot of different ways, but one way to read that story is through a liberation narrative, mm -hmm. right? Like she was about to be killed. He comes right into that situation and he's like, nah, not today. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. And so then there's freedom. Now he invites her to live a different life, but the challenge that I always have when I preach about that is I go, but what if right after he has that interaction, she goes back to that life? Mm -hmm. Like, like how then does that like sit with you with where Jesus is and what he's mm -hmm. saying, right? Like, did he run her down to make sure that everything he told her she was uh, adhering to? No, he intervened at the time that she needed it. And, and I've mm -hmm. heard theologians and pastors say, if you want to know what it looks like to be a sinner in the presence of God, look to the story of the woman caught in adultery. Right. Mm -hmm. She is guilty, as it were. Mm -hmm. We're not even dealing with the fact they don't bring the man. That's a huge yeah. problem. Right. We already got yeah, yeah. patriarchal yeah. issues. We yep. got gender issues. If she's naked, we've got shame that's mm -hmm. there. I mean, all kinds of tomfoolery. I imagine Jesus uh, in the sand writing out the sins of all the people who have mm -hmm. uh, brought her to him. And then they walk away when they see their name because they're like, whoa, I don't want that out on blast. But mm -hmm. but look at what he does he humanizes her right he looks he he waits he doesn't actually look at her mm -hmm. he he keeps his eyes downcast he asks her questions he humanizes her like mm -hmm. like why yeah. are you here what's going on right those are liberating activities he doesn't accept the status quo he doesn't even accept the status quo that if you know depending on your christology and how you make jesus god and all those things that are all about him mm -hmm. right they're all about him and yet people have missed it and so now he's in the moment and he's saying man you have missed the, you know, the trees for the forest or, you know, however the idiom goes, right? You've missed this point about this humanizing thing that I want to do. So that's mm. super key to me for liberation. Um, of course, um, Howard Thurman is, is a, sort of someone who's in this uh, story. Alfonso Johnston, who mm -hmm. is a Pentecostal, is in this story. Uh, of course, uh, James Cone uh, yeah. is in this story. Willie James uh, Jenkins um, and a host of others have been informing my understanding. But let me just say, I like you, came to liberation theology in college and it was all through mm. a roman catholic lens and yes. i remember the very yeah. first time i heard about liberation theology i called my dad who uh, my godfather who's a pastor and i was like dad like i have a catholic friend and she's gonna spend her whole summer in uh columbia like advocating mm. for people's rights and she was telling me about liberation theology like what is this? And I remember that I can I can tell you where I was. I can tell you what the weather was. Like mm -hmm. I I remember learning about that, and I didn't put that together until way way later in in my ministry life. I would say mm -hmm. um, Mike Brown was probably my catalyst uh, to a lot of the, okay. the liberating aspects of the gospel. Like when mm -hmm. Mike Brown got killed, I was preaching through the Psalms on lament. Mm. Go figure. And yeah. um, and I had a lament <laughs> that day yeah. because yeah. Uh, Mike Brown was killed and left in the street. Now we have a mm. we have a doctors in our church and I had someone who does autopsies and he he immediately said the reason why they left him there was because they had to do X, Y, Z. And I was like, yep, we always have a reason for mm -hmm. uh, how we dishonor human bodies. We yeah. always have a reason. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah and I mean, so, but, I, I've I've heard all you know. So I've uh, I've had interaction with police officers and um, about things like this. And it's interesting how, like, there seems to be a way for us to 
be able to do an autopsy without dishonoring a human body. You know, I, I mean, we we see it all in other uh, other situations where we'll cover somebody or that, you know, like there's or the eyes. will get. I mean, there's just a lot of things that we do. And I, I remember I, I think it might have been some stuff you were writing at the time about that, because I remember, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that uh, in my in my um, in in my thinking about that time, you know, I know that there were a lot of things that you wrote that were really helpful for me just in processing it, too, you know, of of, of honoring human bodies. And I. I think you're right, but it is interesting how we have a way of justifying dishonoring. I mean, in like all over culture, and especially Absolutely. with mm -hmm. people who have been oppressed. <laughs> like, yep. it's, well, and it's it was dehumi Ra. dehumanizing. It was Dr. Ra, um, mm. uh, Suntan Ra, who yes. uh, he he does a fantastic job of this in his book Prophetic Lament, right? Yeah. And then he writes yeah. he Great rewrites book. what Lim Lamentations five he, as a O to Mike Brown. He rewrites mm -hmm. it, and and I heard him do that at a conference, a multi ethnic conference in Memphis, the Kynos Conference by uh, mm. Brian Loretz, and and that was my first introduction to Dr. Ra and Corey. Edwards, who will then show up later at Vineyard conferences when mm -hmm. Gino Olson begins yeah. to put together the Vineyard Multi-Ethnic Conference. So I've I've been following them because I hadn't I hadn't put those things together. Now he's writing a book on lamentations, mm -hmm. and as pastors, none of us want to spend a bunch of time preaching yeah. on lamentations. You know, it just it it just doesn't like heat the heart. It's the it's way. like Leviticus <laughs> is probably the number one we want to avoid, and then lamentations is like <laughs> really close, like, that's really right. close. That's right. And depending on where you are, sex wise, you want to stay out as yeah. long as all of yeah. it too. Okay, yeah. that's, so true. <laughs> that's true too. That's true. But so, hey, Mark Driscoll built his whole entire empire oh God, please, off of Song please. of Solomon. But that's just because he was repressed in his sexuality. I like how I said the I word <laughs> Mark Driscoll and all of a sudden you started having like, <laughs> like an emotional breakdown. Well, it, it's just because anyway, we, we, could, we could have a whole he still has a church. Yet. Let's just be honest. The I know. dude still has a church with hundreds of people that follow okay, it. Okay, so I, two I, things, two things from my perspective. When you're white, you get to fall up. That's just how it works, right? You you can do whatever you want, and then you just fall up into success. Okay. True. <laughs> I, I don't, I know, right? <laughs> and then number two, like uh, a lot of people like his brand of Christianity. Like one of the things that I've learned oh, no. is that there are a lot of people who want me to tell them what to do. Yeah. And no, that's true. <laughs> No, I, like, and I think it's interesting because in our type of Christianity, hopefully, in a healthy, functioning uh, spirituality and pneumatology, all these qualifiers, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, Donnell. Uh. Anyway, but it's crazy because I remember we we had uh, when I was pastoring this other church, I had this couple come to our church one time who had left an ultra Pentecost, like UPC United Pentecostal Church, so non-Trinitarian, you know very legalistic and but they got offended at the pastor and so they came to our church because we were the closest to charismatic whatever and uh and i had a meeting with him one time and he just he looked me now he's like well pastor i just want to know what kind of leadership you're going to give me and he did have a southern accent so i'm not even i know i was like, like should you I'm be doing get, should you be I'm doing probably get, <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't but i'm going to and uh what he said he said you know like i want to know and I and I was like, well, I, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I want to know if I'm going to buy a car, you're going to tell me what color to get. And I was like, I thought he was joking. I was like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and so I said, I said, oh, that's, you know, I was like, oh no, absolutely not. I'm like, I don't care what color car you, get. I don't care what car you get. And never saw him again. And I mean, they wow. were they were really looking for a real strong pastoral leader leader because they had had that in their previous church and. I think you're right. There's a lot of people like that, but uh, uh, but anyway, back to what well, we were talking back about. To, <laughs> back to back to Mark Yeah, off Thurman and 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 Cone, right? So yeah, yeah. so like I I didn't know about Thurman um, until the last um, probably the last five or six years, and so since learning about him and his book Jesus and the Disinherited, mm -hmm. you know, I then realized like, wow, Thurman is the progenitor of MLK. And um, I don't know which library, I just saw it on my timeline the other day, but some library, it might be at Stanford, Stanford Library actually has the letters that King and Thurman exchanged. Wow. And I don't know if they're digitized yet, but they do have them. Um, okay. And you, in the writing, you can see how much honor... Uh, 
um, you can see the honor that um, uh, King has for Thurman because Thurman is, war, you know, he's he's writing during World War II, right? And and so it's a very interesting time uh, in the country and what's happening, right? You got the Japanese internment, you've got the 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 sort of this Christianized march of hegemony coming through from Europe uh, <laughs> under the Third Reich and and all of that. I like how you said that. I just wanted to say that was very very well very well stated. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well done. And so, and so, and then he's writing about the the sort of the the disinherited, and then Cone picks up that mantle, and then he runs fully with it. And it's not until Cone's later in life mm -hmm. does he get all of sort of the honorifics of what yeah, he's yeah. worked out early on. He couldn't get a publisher. He couldn't um, get people. And who's the woman? Aldrich is that her name? She wrote. Uh, something about the cross and she finished this 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 big sweeping book of the cross and she she didn't know who james cone was even yeah. though they were both at trinity at the same time yeah 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 and and she had never ever been introduced to his work of linking lynching yeah to the cross yeah, and, yeah. And, and 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 that was revelatory to me, right? That that there's a there's a way that we can live our Christian witness mm -hmm. and ignore the plight of people that we are immediately adjacent to. Yeah, that's right. And and I don't know what Jesus is going to say to me if that's my witness at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That that he's like, wow, you built a really great ministry, Donnell. You know, John Wimber has a lot yeah. of quotes of like, you know, you built your ministry, <laughs> let me show you mine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind that's of right. thing. And, 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 and he's like, you, you did all these things, but I, I didn't see you at the jail. I, mm. I didn't see you in the food lines. I didn't see you um, uh, interacting with the kids who were marginalized in the school systems. I didn't see you teach someone how to read. Now I'm going through a list. All, let me finish of, this. Hold on. Yeah, let question. me finish that part because I because I I, I I preach and talk defensively. So <laughs> so, so one, one of the objections that I hear right away. <laughs> is that people will say, yeah, yeah, why did you pick those things? Now, those are just the things that that are in the front of my mind. There are things that other people are doing that are just as valid that I won't ever mm -hmm. come into proximity with. I think the thing I'm trying to get at is how are we living this Christian witness? Are yeah. we trying to follow the Holy Spirit where the Spirit is leading us? And in our movement, we talk about the Holy Spirit a lot, you know, like if we could trademark the Holy Spirit, I think we would. Right? I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't, we definitely yeah, trademark the Holy we Spirit. Tried. And yeah. so and so like there's this sense of us saying with one side of our mouths, come Holy Spirit. Mm. And with the other side missing when the Spirit shows up and i have more to say about that but you were trying to jump in so i'll, I'll pause yeah, there well i was I, I i so i think what you're saying is brilliant um and also very much in line with what so much in the sacramental world like i i'm thinking about it from the sacramental perspective like that's exactly what i've uh i've been reading i've been thinking i've been trying to pursue is that it seems like charismatics are really good at recognizing the holy spirit when it comes to the gift of tongues prophecy praying for healing and maybe evangelism, like we might throw a bone there. But, uh, but you know, the question is, how might the Holy Spirit be at work in other spaces, other habits, other rhythms, other practices? Um, so I think you're right on, right on with that. Um, I want to go back to the liberation stuff, though, um, because I this is kind of what I discovered as well. And I guess I want to get your take on it, because what you're talking about is how uh, I'll use the word systems uh, are systems that educate us give us one reading like I, i'm thinking the evangelical world liberation theology is naughty like it, it almost is as what i what i would say a lot of my um influences in seminary were like yeah they have a lot of good things to say but they take it too far 
And it's all. <laughs> is, is that when we call God black? When God is, yeah. when, when, when hey. you say that God is black? <laughs> yeah. Let's not go too far. Uh, no, but it was like all, because I think it was always tied to liberal theology. Oh, you sure. Know, the, yeah, like, yeah. like progressive theology, which liberal liberation theology and, and liber, liberal theology to me are not the same thing. They're I not the know, same. I need They're to know what you same. mean. Yeah, I need to yeah. know what you mean by liberation, liberal theology anyway, because uh, I've been told I'm liberal. Uh, oh, you? I, oh, that's all I, I am. I'm a, hey, I'm well, a I know that. You liberal. are. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, Donnell's the most progressive. Like, I'll have him on the podcast, but I'm not to edit everything. Uh, no, but so, so here's what I'm wondering. Um, so you have, you have our, like, we learn from who is teaching us. And so That's right. for, for many people, um, and it's part of the system, um, is we've learned about liberation theology via like the traditional, I guess the evangelical world would be, Hey, there's these Roman Catholics down in Central America and mm -hmm. they just started talking about this in the 1900s. Um, and so we should, check them out. They have some positive things to say, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of things that you should leave behind. But this last summer, um, I, I did my best to read as much, um, uh, I, I would say black theologians who mm -hmm. I didn't classify as liberal or liber liberation theology, but I've discovered they all are. They mm -hmm. like, they all basically are like, cause you mentioned Cone, Cone, Cone's, um, you know, the cross and the lynching tree. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking right here, also Jesus and the disinherited. Um, mm -hmm. There were a, a number of books I read uh, over this last year who essentially it's, it was fascinating to me. And I mean, fascinating in a negative way though. Like it was sad in a sense that they have been marginalized, overlooked and not included in the grand narrative of liberation theology. So it's it's weird, and I and I wonder, maybe you have a thought on why is it that Latinos in Latino liberation theology has had a prominent place in the conversation, but um, African American liberation theolo theologians have essentially been kind of like discovered <laughs> in the last year, while they've been writing uh, writing and addressing liberation. Um, uh, concerns for mm -hmm. a really long time. So the the simple answer is like the the thing Say that it. will get me into trouble. Uh, Say it. Because I want I'm, I'm going to bring up this thing that is the boogeyman of the evangelical church right now, yeah. right? Which is critical mm -hmm. race theory. So when you <laughs> when you get into it, it, it it's white supremacy. I mean, I think I think the thing that was so revelatory to me was reading um, Janine uh, Fletcher Hill's uh, book, The Sin of White Supremacy. Mm. So uh, she's Catholic. She's at, I think, Fordham University. Um, she, she, it's a very thin book. Uh, and she does two things in that book. <clears throat> she traces all of this, um, the, some of the problems that we're finding today, not just the issue of um, how whites and blacks interact with each other in the U.S., but also Asian Americans, uh, women, uh, 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 immigrants that are coming across the border. She ties it all back to two things. She says it's the supremacy of Christianity and coupling that with white supremacy. So you put those two things together, and now you see what she calls, and I agree, this demonic uh, thing. She calls it witchcraft. Okay. So I grew up Pentecostal. Um, actually apostolic is what I grew up. So that's where I came to faith. All right. So is that like um, a non-Trinitarian type of apostolic? Uh, they were getting super close to Jesus only. Okay. Like I didn't know that when I was in it. Um, mm -hmm. but they certainly didn't like Mary. Uh, there were some, you know, Catholic things that they had lots of issues yeah. with, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Sort of like yeah. calling the church, the, the, the whore of Babylon and so yeah. forth. And, and I remember when I, I met my first, like that. yeah, like I met my first Catholic friend at college and I was like, you're going to hell cause you're Catholic and you, you don't know Jesus in the part of your sins. And she's still my friend. Uh, thanks be to God. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and she was really patient with me, you know, she, she, she like explained her faith and 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 she actually opened some doors again she's the person i had this first conversation with liberation theology about because she was dealing with it in latin america so i think part of the issue is um somebody said this at a conference i was at 
And I'll offline, I'll let you take two guesses on who it was. And and <laughs> what, what they said. <laughs> <laughs> what they said at this conference is in their home, and I think it's really appropriate. You have a bookshelf behind you. They're like in their home, they have a bookshelf. And on this bookshelf are books that haven't been written, uh, that are that are older than 50 years. Okay. And the room heard that as we get caught up in new fads right? There's new Christian writers that are coming. Take Driscoll, for instance, right? I mean, he wrote a lot. And then we saw the toxicity well, that came didn't, out of that. He didn't write it, we found we out. Know, we know, he plagiarized a lot. He, he lifted. it. He just forgot yeah. to quote. He forgot to quote. His name's That's on some books. His name's he, on some books. He forgot to put his citations in. If there's anything that I appreciate about you is citations. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I take yeah, that I mean, off of it. Yeah, no, like meaning you 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 are gonna cite some stuff. I got I got like a, a personal thing I wrote to you and it came back with citations, you and another friend. So anyway. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I was like, this is a new class of nerd. Like I thought uh, I was a nerd, but this is a whole I, new class of nerd. So warm right now. Oh <laughs> so 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 when this person said this, the room heard it through the lens they intended it. OK, so if I lean into that person, they intended it to say there is wisdom from people who are much, much older than us. Right. That that was really like the conventional wisdom. But because I'm also black, what I heard was the people who have been excluded from publishing, their voices shouldn't be listened to. Mm. Now that person never intended, like if I went up to them and said, here's something that you, that is an unintended consequence of what you just said. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not just people of color, it was women too, right? Like, you know, there not a lot of women are, are published theologians that happens in what the last 50, 65 years. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and in the evangelical world of like 20, like let's right. be 20. Yeah, let's be honest. And so Cone is writing in the 70s, mm -hmm. right? The late 60s and the 70s, right? 50 years now. Yeah. He might not have made it on that shelf. Mm -hmm. So 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 now you're having this conversation where the writers who are working through this. Now, I would say, like right now, uh, Henry uh, Louis Gates just did a PBS series on the black church. Yeah. And, yeah. and Snow, Stephanie Snow uh, purchased a book that I think came out of that. Yeah, um, it's a book. He wrote a book. Yeah, I have it. I yeah, ordered it too. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, the other day, and she's also watching the, she was telling me about it. It's awesome. So, so, yeah. so he he's going to chronicle the black church, and I would say every Vineyard pass everybody who watches your podcast is a four hour two segment documentary on PBS. Watch it; I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Here are two things that I will just say in answer to your question of why this is a problem. One, I don't think we just we don't take the voices of black people seriously. I mean, I just think I just think that is the reality in yeah. America. We just don't. We just don't. Um, it, it's in our ethos. We, we have, if you don't see someone as being human and then they start saying things to you, it's like a horse speaking to you, you know, you're just like, I, I don't know what to do with this. Right mm -hmm. now, a lot of people are going to disengage from that because they, they can't make that connection. But I would just say, mm -hmm. let's just look at the evidence of how that works. Take InterVarsity, for instance, in 1970, the a black man stands on a stage at Urbana and lays out the multi-ethnic future of InterVarsity. Now go and look at InterVarsity and ask from what, what that person said almost 50 years ago to where you are today, the oldest parachurch Christian organization in North America, okay, mm -hmm. InterVarsity is, um, and where are you uh, on that scheme, okay? So that, like, yes, we heard it. It was this moment, but did we actually internalize it and change how we are leading and running our ministries, right? Mm -hmm. And that they're still dealing with things today that this person addressed 50 years ago, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold on for a second. <laughs> this is, for our listeners, this is the beauty of uh, doing things with our families. As you've known, I have a train sometimes in the background of my <laughs> my audio and video. Uh, so Donnell is totally allowed to 
do his thing. Actually, I hope he's yelling at staff members right now. He's at his no, no, room. I'm at home. I'm not yelling crack, at my staff. Cracking the whip, <laughs> firing of three right. pastors. All right, so that's number one. Okay. Number two, um, Nat Turner uh, leads a liberation revolt in Southampton County, Virginia. And he does that based on his reading of scripture, that he has this narrative of liberation that he reads into scripture, right? Which is one of the reasons why slaves uh, or those who were enslaved, because I just don't want to put them in a category of slaves, they were enslaved, someone enslaved them. And I think we have to pay attention to that and pay attention yeah. to our language because we tend to talk about slaves as just this, like it was this thing they fell into as yeah. opposed to Happened that- to be yeah, that, that someone is actively torturing them. And in yeah. a great book to help uh, listeners and viewers who haven't um, read a lot about slavery is The Half That's Never Been Told by Baptists. Okay. I think, I, um, and that's all economic. So there you go. You, you can, and there's a section in that book where he talks about how the slave drivers and masters innovated torture techniques to get compliance out of the people they were enslaving. Because a lot of people have this false narrative that, that it was all hunky-dory uh, kind of environment for slavery, that the slaves were fed, they were clothed, they were housed. Uh, Doug and Wilson uh, made a, actually, uh, I think, I don't know if you're familiar with Doug Wilson, reformed, yeah. uh, reformed guy. Uh, everything you would oppose is found in this man okay <laughs> from what i know about you and uh and also me, myself too i like i loathe his uh theology and work but he actually wrote a book uh because he's a historian and wanted to rightly um correct the narrative and so essentially he had a book out for a while that was about how it was actually not that bad for slaves mm -hmm. uh, which is you know i crazy um i had a professor who was um an African-American that once said this that I thought was really provocative um, in regard to what you're saying. Like, I had never thought about that. Um, he, in the same way that Christian theologians often point out how the Roman, um, the Roman guards, the Roman centurions were expert torturers, that's what the slave owners were. In, yeah. in our history. It wasn't like they were just, you know, like, let's just go pick cotton and everybody's going to be happy and we're going to help our economy and you're going to get your lemonade and your steak. It was brutal. It was grotesque. It was evil. I used the word demonic earlier to, to kind of encompass this. I mean, I think that's, that's something that we have to not just brush over. So I, I really want to say thank you, Donnell, for that. Um, referring to people as enslaved versus slaves is actually a crucial um I, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's yeah. actually quite It's just helpful. in our language. And someone corrected my language. So I'm not I, I'm not the progenitor yeah. of it. It was someone who was just like, why are you talking about this passively? As if they they fell no. into it. It was like yeah. there was someone at the end of the whip. And yeah. Yeah. the person who was often at the end of the whip was someone who believed, who had a faith story to tell. Yeah. And you used know? the Bible to As justify. Tool, which yeah. is what I, I was coming to before I had to pause. So two things. All right, back to Nat Turner. So Nat Turner is in Southampton County in 1831, okay? And he leads a liberation activity to free the slaves in South, Southampton, uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is my family is from Southampton County, Virginia. The place where his rebellion took place is a place called Jerusalem, Virginia. It's now called Cortland, Virginia. And my family is from there. And I can trace back my ancestors to about 1832, which is around the time that he led this um, revolt against the wow. enslavement. And it changed the law in, his revolt changed the law in Virginia. OK, now, when you learn his story, when you go and read his story, you'll read he had a Bible. They, 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 his Bible has actually survived. And I think they, they, they have an artifact, his, his Bible. And, mm -hmm. and the enslaver would uh, edit the scripture. OK, they would take out any story about liberation in the, in, in the Bible. Right. So you get the Bible and all of Exodus is gone. Like, yeah, a lot the whole of book. <laughs> you know, major the judges, major you know, like all of the prophets, right? The major prophets. Like you, you, you begin to realize 
like um, that that this was this is not just something that emerged mm. in, in Cone's imagination, right? This is something that that he's linking back to, which is why I reference Gates's the Black Church because the Black Church has had a story of liberation from its inception, right? You, you've got um, uh, the Allen who founds the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He's praying inside the church. The white people walk in and they say, you have to leave. And he says, fine, we will leave. Can we finish our prayers? They say, no, you must leave right now. So that's a liber he, he's experiencing the oppression. And what does it create? It creates a God-inspired response. And what's the God-inspired response? It's a liberation piece, right? So Black people in the country from my point of view, have been doing liberation theology since the inception of the church, right? Mm -hmm. But there hasn't been recognition. Why? Because to recognize that what we have been preaching and teaching since the exception of the Black church in these Americas is right and true is to simultaneously acknowledge your culpability ability and partnership in the oppression which creates the need for the liberation that's why right there there yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a judgment and yeah. we don't know what to do with judgments right so like when your wife like laid it out for you because you didn't you know you were supposed to do the dishes and you didn't do the dishes mm. like you might be a little bit further along in your marital relations than I. You're my, you're, 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 my first response is not, wife, you are right. I have injured you. I am sorry. I will make recompense, right? My first response is to protect myself, right? It's like, I'm tired. I'm like, we have five kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, but do, you, do you feel like, uh, so with, so what I'm hearing you say is, is one of the reasons why uh, evangelicalism, which I, I know that's like, I don't even know what that means anymore. I know what it means historically. Yes. Truly, like I'm really, Donnell, like this is so hard because I've gone back and forth. I don't remember if, if you were in the room when a couple of years ago, uh, Steve Bernhope and Thomas Creedy did their papers on evangelicalism. And I was like, I'm so torn because on one hand, I don't want to use that term anymore because of what it means today. But I'm also so hesitant to give up that word because of what it meant historically. And, yeah. um, and, and so anyway, uh, but evangelicalism as a whole or American Christianity, let's even broaden it a little bit, has been willing to engage with Latino or Central American, South American liberation theologians and, and at least listen to them, but has been unwilling to listen to the voices of African American theologians who have been making the exact same arguments and have you, and actually I think in some cases, well, no, have many examples uh, that, that hurt but are part of our history, um, you, you feel like the reason why that's happened is because for white Christianity, American Christianity to have to wrestle with that is to have to acknowledge the collective um, sins of our past in a way that we are unwilling to do. Yeah, that I mean, I look at what's happening right now in the Southern Baptist Convention. Right. I mean, the whole yeah. thing. I want to is talk about CRT with you. Let's do it. it, it the whole thing is blowing up over yeah. CRT. Right. I, I and. And you, and you had American pastors are leaving by yeah, in droves. dates, the preeminent. I mean, have you heard that man yeah. preach? Like, yes. I, 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 like, I thought I was good. I thought I knew how I to bring the word of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, and then I, I like, don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 but, but look at that. You have the, you have the seminarians, right? You have the deans and the presidents of what the six major or eight major yeah. uh, Southern Baptist um, uh, seminaries come out and say that the greatest threat, not white nationalism, uh, yeah, yeah, not no. white <laughs> Christian nationalism, not yeah. Trumpism, but the greatest threat that's facing the gospel is critical race theory. My Lord, my it, it's, Lord. It's so tone deaf. 
<laughs> it feels so tone deaf that it's hard to. I, I actually thought it was a joke. I when they were talking, I about, did too. I I, I, I was thought like, it was the onion surely, like, yeah, like one surely, of the <laughs> surely the six seminaries did not make this statement given the climate of the world we're in. Because I and I because I'd say this. I um I would assume simply for marketing purposes. That's it. Like I'm not even going to give concede that it was because but of if the you virus. don't actually want black people. Mm. Let this Bless is the this hard up. part. This yeah. is this is really the hard part, right? Because I you see this in a lot of stuff, right? Like you know, I've led our church through becoming a multi-ethnic church, right? And so I've read every book written about it. And the one thing that is universal is that it's hard to impossible to do, right? That That's effectively what everybody says. Like you'll get some success, but eventually the church will become monocultured again. So if it's a white church and it becomes multicultural, eventually it will become monocultured again. And the reason why is because the white people will leave because they don't actually have to stay. And, and this is like that underbelly, like as we, as we move into whatever part of the conversation we're in now, but this is that underbelly. Like as we have been, we've been on a multi-ethnic journey for 12 years, I think mm -hmm. as a church. We, when we started, we were 96% white. Today, we're about 56% white. And uh, we, we have two responses to that. One, people will say, what happened to all the white people? I was like, we didn't actually get rid of the white people. We just added more people of color. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> we keep them in the back. Uh, you know, and and, and 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 every day we get new white people to our church just to, yeah. to you know, let everyone is like, oh, you know, what, what's happening to the white people? But, but what? <laughs> what Oh. No, but what I but what I will also say is I spend probably more of my time in this conversation dealing with the white people who threaten to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is for a, pl a plethora of reasons, right? Okay. It, it, it's never any one thing. Right. It, it could be the words that you're using, the tone that you're taking, the focus that you have. You talk about race too much, Donnell. In fact, I don't talk about race enough. Right. <laughs> like that, that's, that's the, the criticisms, though, you hear. Oh, you know, yeah, it is. Yeah. But if you took if you took five you years, know I was, you know, I was, you know, I was being I white know, person, I know you were. Right? Yeah, I know. Okay. Like yeah, now I'm back to not being a white person. It's OK. Well, I mean, yes. <laughs> so if you took the five years of my sermons. And yeah. you put it into a, a, you know, a corpus maker, right? That does yeah. indexing. Your and themes. You, yeah. And you pulled out what my themes were. I, I, I don't think race would make 10%. I, yeah. I, I listen to a lot of your sermons, um, you know, <laughs> on my podcast. Uh, I don't, I was going to say, I don't, I feel like you are not that guy. <laughs> which no, but to yeah. white people, I talk about race all the time. Yeah. I don't, and it took me a long people, time to figure people, that out. Yeah. White people, I, I'm, I'm new to the, uh, it's really weird. It, it's just weird now, I think in pastoring in general, because it's so hard to know how to talk about any subject, because no matter what you say, someone's going to be upset. And I, I think that's right. true for every pastor in the world. But when it comes to politics, uh, race, uh, ethnic diversity, ra we just don't know how to do that, which is why I love, I've been loving um, these pod podcast episodes I've been doing just because of, for my own, it's like, I want to talk about these things and I want to be able to do it in a way that's, that's um, help. I don't know, helping me understand the way that people are thinking and um, you know, because I think that we have lost the ability to have um, conversations in today's world, just in the way that we function in society. Like we don't know how to disagree or to, you know, to do that. Um, which, which I want to, I want to get into CRT for a minute because I, I really sure. want, yeah, go ahead. I want your, I want your thoughts on this because I've been trying to get. This is gonna sound. I'm like asking all my black friends. Okay, <laughs> that's like the typical white person thing. So, I'm like, help me out. Uh, are we friends? Are we friends? Uh, Luke? Yes, Donnell. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm never. I'm <laughs> after this episode, you're dead to me. Um, I, I'm. I, so I've. 
like uh, Esau's book, Reading the Bible While Black, is mm-hmm. fantastic. I'm a huge fan of him. Um, mm-hmm. I I just love everything he writes and says because secretly in my heart I'm Anglican. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's that's the real truth is that you're I, a real Anglican and, and you just got caught by the Holy Spirit and so now I, you want to just be I a know. charismatic Anglican. I, I mean, I, I am. I'm that's the what most, Todd's doing. Go go I hang out with Todd. He, I'm he Anglican, but I'm not there with the whole apostolic secession thing. I'm just not. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Um, I I've been trying to wrestle through because uh, something he read wrote a while ago about CRT essentially laid out my where I'm at because he basically said the fact that people are losing their mind about CRT right now is is in light of the systemic racism and oppression that still exists is asinine that's that's me that's my way of fleshing out what he said okay he said it in way better words um and so i was like all right i don't even know anything about crt i i i got that time you know a couple years ago i had i knew critical theory mm-hmm. that's it so i did my best to read as much um crt work from like the original sources which were all lawyers and it's all li- lawyer that's what's hilarious is it's like mm-hmm. all legal theory mm-hmm. so i came out of it and i'm like i'm not a fan of crt okay. i i think as a methodology i think it's not it's not the best methodology, okay. but here's my theory um, is I think when you are being oppressed and you are part of a marginalized people group, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm. And, and so my way of understanding and I'm and I'm like, I'm not the guy who's saying CRT is the, you know, it's undermining the gospel and our seminaries need to put out a position paper on it. I'm not at all. I just don't think as a methodology, it's the most helpful way of, of doing um, social justice or liberation theology, or like, I just wonder if there's other methodologies or I want to say, yeah, it's like, it's like foundationalism. Like, yeah, there's parts of that I like, (laughs) but I also want to say no, Um, you know? Um, And so uh, that's the way I've been thinking about CRT. So it's like, I'm not at a place where I can say, you know, oh my gosh, we need to seriously put down a position paper on it and clarify it's the most concerning thing about the kingdom of God. Like I would want to talk about biblical authority um, way before that. I would want to talk about Christian um, uh, nationalism and white supremacy a bit, a bit more. Um, so does that make sense? And like what, what, when I talk about that and that in those terms and I make those clarifications, is, am I crazy? Am I not reading enough? Am I, what am I well, missing? I mean, I think it, I think it's up to you. I mean, I, I think that's the, the gift that we have in, in the world that we live in. Like you get to decide in a lot of ways how you want to engage it. Right. Um, for me, I think the thing that is helpful. So, so we talk about CRT, critical race theory. Make sure we define what we're saying so everybody knows. <laughs> and that, you know, it's Christian research. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that, um, you know, it's a theory as theories go, right? So, like, one of the things I think people, you know, like, um, um, I think the thing I want to say here is like when people come to conversations that have already started. And the language has already been defined. People have reactions. We all have reactions Mm -hmm. to that kind of conversation, right? I mean, I remember, I'm going to back it out for a second. I remember trying to understand how I approached baptism. So I got baptized first in Southampton uh, County, uh, Virginia, at my great-grandfather's church uh, that he was a deacon at and a founder of. Uh, as a fifth grader. And I got baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then, and I didn't have a good grasp of what I was doing in this activity, right? Like joining myself with the body of Christ and both uh, Jesus's body, but, you know, the, the, the cloud of witnesses. Later in life, I'm now in this apostolic tradition, and we do everything in Jesus' name. And, 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 and Paul says, everything you do in word and deed, do it in the name of Jesus. And I remember like doing these logic things with people. Like you can't write a check that is the, the wife of, you know, the husband of Susan, the father of Doug, uh, the son of Alfred, right? You, you just can't, nobody's going to sign that check until you put your name on it, Luke. Mm 
And so why in baptism would we baptize people into titles? And, and I remember like agonizing over my baptism. Mm. What, did I have the right baptism? If I died today, would I go to hell because I wasn't baptized in Jesus name? Okay. So I got baptized again uh at a pentecostal church in jesus's name my dad and i were there he was the visiting pastor and and they were having baptism he's like hey you can get baptized and i was like all right sure and i had already received the gift of tongues and in this setting um they helped you receive the gift of tongues. Yep. i don't know if you've ever bro I just want people to know I'm for real. Like I think sometimes people think because you because we read a lot. Like we haven't yeah, been. You're, in, you're in not real. You're not, like, oh, you're not really charismatic, are you? Yes. You have. <laughs> so I got the I got the gift of tongues twice, uh, so that that guy uh, would leave me alone, and then um, now I'm a minister of the gospel, and I have to baptize people. And our tradition is we just baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But because of my upbringing, because of my wrestling, I baptize everybody also in the name of Jesus. So what I say is I baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I baptize you. Mm-hmm. So you cover it. And, yeah. and, 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 and I, and I know for some people that would be like, oh, that's so ridiculous. Like people don't understand like this and that, and, and we can have the debates. Heck, we can even write a paper about it and we can take two sides <laughs> <laughs> on it. Right. But for the person who's caught in that thing, which was mm-hmm. the teenager, me, who was in his bed wondering if I was going to be rejected by God because this thing that was central to my faith was done wrong. Mm -hmm. I want to take that away as much as I can. And so, and we even had a congregant later who left our church, went to another church that uh, does full immersion with Jesus name. And she's like, you baptized me, but I don't think you baptized me in Jesus name. And I go, Oh no, 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 dear. Yes, I did. Because of this conversation we're having right now. And I can tell you how and where and what my liturgy is and how we do that. Mm -hmm. For critical race theory, I think the challenge is we have a lot of us who won't do the reading. I I think Mm -hmm. the thing that I love about you, Luke, is that you read a lot. I mean, you read at a level that is ferocious and, and I am in awe of. And I try to read at least two or three books a week. And yeah. I, I'm not keeping pace. Okay. Like I am falling behind and you know, like the seven books you even showed me before we even got on the call. I was like, Oh man, I'm a little behind. I got to catch up. To catch okay. up, bro. Catch <laughs> up. <laughs> so, 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 so you're going to go and do the work. You're going to go to the original sources. You're going to put the, the critical race theory in its, um, uh, context, and then you're going to work your way from its context into what you're seeing today. And because of critical realism or critical theory or you know other uh, methodologies that you've learned either in seminary, how many PhDs do you have today? Uh, in uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, <Come on. laughs> you, you're going to run it through those lens, and you're going to see problems with it. But you're also going to be able to, I hope, extract meaning and value out of it at the same time. We Mm. do this all of the time. This is all called discernment. Okay. Mm. We don't just, you know, like what, 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 what is it? Uh, The clinic right? In the charismatic environment, right? Mm -hmm. We we changed our language prophetically. I hear God saying, I feel like God is saying, we stopped saying God is saying, right? Mm -hmm. And when we we hear people say, God told me, if you're like me, which in some ways I think we share some kinship, you go, Really? God told you? Because God didn't tell me. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Because we bring a hermeneutic of suspicion mm. to some of those things, which I is a so good... right now. 
<laughs> yes, I'm <am> suspicious. <laughs> Which is a good hermeneutic to have, right? Like we need a hermeneutic of suspension uh, of of suspension to, that that we have in our back pocket, like it's our Swiss Army knife of discerning things. Now, I was uh, trained in a um, a liberal arts college and that one of the the things that they taught us right away was critical realism and then i learned it again when i read nt right right you know he, he brought it back up as yeah, his lawyer yeah That's right. and i was like i like this because it's a way for us to center and anchor ourselves in the world so mm -hmm. here's what i say to people who have issues with critical race theory i say if you commit a crime and people see you as white luke and I commit a crime and they see me as black. Can you explain to me why you get probation and I go to jail for three years? Mm -hmm. And if you can explain that to me, I'll call it whatever the hell you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's called critical race theory. <laughs> what does it mean? It means built into these systems, invisible to the participants of the system, is race. How yeah. do I know? Yeah. Citibank looked at the American culture and economy and said, racism has cost the American uh, economy $16 trillion in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. You want to know what the value of the slaves and their labor, those who were enslaved and their labor was at the time, at the height of uh, enslavement in the United States? It was about $16 trillion. Wow. So that is a that's a every 20 year cost that we mm -hmm. are willing to pay as a country to avoid addressing the issue of race and racism. Yeah, gotcha. Right. So, for, so with your CRT, so with your CRT, do you um, I guess because I'm thinking of rethinking of the way I would phrase it. Um, cause I, I, like, I think in that, in your definition or your understanding, like I would have no problem with CRT in the sense of, you know, like, yeah, I think there, cause I would use the term systemic, um, racism or systemic injustice or, you know, which I know is deeply connected to CRT. I, I understand that. That's why I do like when I say the enemy of my enemy is my friend, like that's the way I've, I've thought about it in the sense of like, I can't hate on CRT because it seems to be addressing issues that are really important, mm -hmm. really problematic, really evil, really demonic. But I, you know, I think maybe this is the, the, um, the scholastic, you know, wanting to, you know, whatever it's like, but, there also has to be nuance a little bit in the way that we apply it. But I mean, we do, but I, I think you, like you acknowledged, I try to do that with any methodology, you know, yeah. it's like, uh, you know, uh, any time we do exegesis, we're doing, you know, some type of biblical critical reading, you know, where it's like, Oh, I want to, this part right here is good. This part right here. I'm not so much a fan of NT Wright does that all over the place. Um, so, you know, when you think about it, for folks like the Southern Baptists who are wanting to write position papers about CRT, because this is the feeling I have, like I've got my thoughts and questions about CRT, but I'm not at a point where I'm like, this is the most pressing issue that we need right. to address. Right. Like, does that almost feel like it's on, it's falling on deaf ears. It's, it's so misses the point of the evil and the atrocity of racism yeah. in America that it's for you as a, as an African American, it's, it's it, like, it's not just painful. It has to be in um, infuriating. But would that you be know, I don't even, I don't even know. Like the, I, I don't, my reaction is, is, is it's not painful um, because I'm not looking for validation from that group as it were. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and, and because I'm not looking for validation, their rejection of me yeah. or whatever values I might espouse to is like okay, like I get it. Um, I think I think what it what's interesting is we've always made a straw men mm. uh, to 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 sort of fight and. You know, like th this will be controversial for some people listening. So before 1970, <laughs> um, Christians didn't care so much about abortion. That's right. That's right. No, it's true. <laughs> it's true. But Christians don't know their history. Yeah. Christians don't know 
that Christian schools in America are have their origins in segregation schools, right? So when you go to look at the Farwells, go to go look at the origins of uh, Liberty University. Liberty mm -hmm. University is started by Jerry Falwell. Falwell is a segregationist. He's a Christian, but he's yeah. a segregationist. Yeah. And, and these are his facts. Yep. And, and, and what, what he does is he creates a Christian educational center to avoid segregate, uh, desegregation. Mm. And it is these, these Christian academies in schools are actually called segregation academies, right? Because this is it. This is the origins of Christian education in America. Now, someone's going to argue, no, Christians have been educating people since blah, 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 blah. Of course, you can always find the exception, but let's look at the yeah. the prevailing the intention behind the that movement was ex was exactly that. Well, you didn't need to have a Christian. Just let's just just stay with me for just one second. You don't need to have a Christian academy mm. if your public school is where you're teaching all of your white kids. <laughs> you only need it when my kids show up. Mm -hmm. And you don't want your kids and my kids to co-mingle, right? And, and, and just so that people just divorce it from their head that that was yesterday. And it, we have come a long way today. Just Google Black History Month in Utah schools in Odin. Because in Utah, because uh, Utah believes in this idea that parents are in charge of the education of their kids, right? Mm -hmm. Seems valid. I want that. I don't want my kids watching things I don't know about. Like, I want to do that. Uh, and so in Utah, they it's Black History Month. So guess what? You could opt your kids out of Black History Month. I see this. It's optional. <laughs> so, so if you... <laughs> So if you want to say that was then, Donnell, you're you you're living in the past. You can't let no, the past go. No, you, no, you, you, you won't heal. <laughs> you won't you heal. Need to, you need to you need to think things are all good now. <laughs> yeah. But but this is this is the problem. But does Utah count? I mean, uh, does, does it count? Utah uh, count? Come on now. Look, the, 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 best, the best people. Who have you don't want to talk about people who have loved to be, even though they got some issues with people who look like me, is Mormons, man. They have been the nicest, kindest people I have yeah. ever interacted with. And yeah. uh my my engagement to my wife features two Mormons. Okay. I'm in Spain. She's there studying. She's uh fluent in Spanish. She's in Sevilla, Spain. I fly over to propose. Um, uh, Josef and I can't remember the uh, the other woman's name. I'll get it from my wife. But um, Josef and and the other woman there, they're they are on mission and they're learning. They're doing their language school uh, with her at the same time, and they help me plan out our engagement in the Alcazar in Sevilla uh, in the court of Carlos V. And so, look, I I have a very special place in my heart. For, for Mormons. And anytime, you know, brother or sister show up at my door, I sit and talk to them and they don't like it. Cause the first thing I say is, am I still a devil? Cause in 1970, like yeah. I was still a devil. Someone, so, someone <laughs> black told me that. so this, the, this, this is what they told me. They said that the Mormons didn't like black people until Brigham Young university wanted to have better sports. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, this is bad. I, I like this is if I ever run for political office, this You're thing out. right here is what's going to disqualify me. <laughs> I, I would be like, yeah, I took him down. Look at <laughs> it. Uh, this yeah. is it. Somebody's going to. Did not Donnell did not say that he, he, he vehemently I laughed. I laughed. That's going to be the thing. They're going to say I did not repudiate awkward. what you said. <laughs> it was an awkward laugh, but <laughs> awkward <laughs> laughs are bad too. I, I want to. Uh, we have so many things we could talk about, and we're. I'm, hopefully, you'll be on another episode uh, sure. tomorrow. Uh, but uh, just let me finish this thought on uh, CRT because yeah. I wasn't. Done. I want right. to. I want you to finish that, but I also want to ask you about your church uh, stuff. That oh, you yeah, yeah, okay, all right, all right. So let me finish this thought on CRT. We've created straw men all the time. Yes. Yeah, so Before 1970, just... Christians didn't care one iota about abortion in the country. Right? There was no national right to life groups, none of this stuff was happening, right? Part and parcel is we need something to be against mm -hmm. in order to define who we are. 
And it, you know, I've had a lot of mentors in my life, um, a lot of them not so good. And one person who wasn't a not so good mentor, but did give me something of value is said, as much as you can define yourself around what you're for. Mm -hmm. And um, let what you're against just sort of let let it materialize or manifest itself as it needs to, but don't spend all of your energy defining who you are in opposition to what you're not. And I think that's what CRT has become for the church today. I, I think the idea, okay. yeah, that the church would have to confront its racist past. I mean, the, the paper I was going to write before uh, SVS. <laughs> Oh, yes, do, do, do share. The paper I was going to write for before um, SBS was going to be on the homogeneous unit principle mm -hmm. and how that had an unintended consequence of creating a white, a largely white um, Pentecostal movement, which is the vineyard. Um, I don't think John Wimber, as much as I know about him, and I know very little, but as much as, and I know you know a lot more. Um, about him. I don't think he set out to make a whites only movement. I mean, I don't think at the end of the day, he was thinking, I just want to create this lily white movement that no people of color will ever find a home in. But here I am, like I'm here and I want to feel like I can belong, but there are institutional things that are in the way. And one of those things that are in the way is like the homogeneous um, unit principle. That whole idea that um, Wimber and um, was it Kraft, whoever, um, somebody that he was at uh, Fuller with. And, and I started reading about it. And it, 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 it was a guy who was doing mission work in India. And when you, when you read the stories, okay, Luke, and you'll appreciate this, and some of your listeners will, go back and read. Like the origins of the homogeneous principal unit has to do with uh, the failure of church growth. It is a missionary in India who is not seeing enough conversions, even though he thinks he should be. And, and then he, he won't confront what I would argue was, maybe you're just, maybe you're just bad at what you were doing. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it, yeah, it's just like- A lot of missionaries have done that. They've failed, well, actually a lot of pastors, uh, they fail at doing ministry and then they go become professors and they write books on it on uh, their failure. And yeah. then it was, I wasn't seeing the same number of converts that this other group should have been. And mm -hmm. so instead of me understanding that why I was failing was I wasn't contextualizing my message. It was that I was applying my message too broadly and that the most effective way is to just get rid of the differences Mm -hmm. and, and get it. And here's the interesting thing. When it comes to the U.S., there is a critique of the homogeneous unit principle that says, is this racist? And they answer the question and then they ignore the answer that they give. And I like as I was reading the original source material and working through, you know, formating my argument about like, we have to dismantle this entire system mm -hmm. and reimagine the system because it takes too much energy. Like I have to build a multi-ethnic church by changing what the church is. And then I have people who've come to my church who were like, I came when we are a white church. Now you're trying to make us into a multi-ethnic church. And I don't like that. Mm. And then I feel like, well, yeah, there's some kind of social contract that got broken with you, right? Mm -hmm. Like at the beginning, they should have said this was always going to be a multi-ethnic church, right? That it, it wasn't going to be a white culture church only. But that was how the kingdom. Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the kingdom. That There is no whites only section of the kingdom, no blacks only section of the kingdom. And we say that, mm -hmm. but I don't think we actually believe it. I it's, mean, if like you hard. and- no, it's, it's, and I, I right now and whoever hears this, I think people believe they're going to get to heaven and Jesus is going to be blue eyed, blonde, uh, seven foot Adonis ripped muscle guy, which, you know, if you really want that, Jesus, if yeah. you want that, Jesus, the Mormons 
have that Jesus. That's the and Jesus. Now you're not going to be president. You just you just crossed it over. Um, yeah, that's 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 good. I uh, love what I'm watching right now. Just so you know, <laughs> parenting is the best. Uh, hey, um, we are going to wrap up in a second. Okay, yeah, sorry, you wanted to talk about the church. Sorry. Well, uh, no, there's so many things that uh, you just said that I we like need to do a full podcast on. Because I, I actually I do want to have you on again, Donnell, because I think yeah, it'd be I would love to come back. I mean, I yeah. this was a really fun conversation. I didn't know yeah. how it was going to go, honestly, and it, it, it like. <laughs> I know, bro. Well, I don't know, Luke. It's just like it's um, Black History Month. You you're featuring a lot of black people. Yeah. I I just didn't know if oh. I was checking the box for you. So, you know, uh, I'm happy to well, come. You are. Just box. so you know, I'm so glad. I won't be able to talk to you until next February. <laughs> but um, I, I told I this is my whole thing with Stephanie. I said, I don't want to even I don't want to ask all these black people in February because they're all going to think that. Sure. So in March, so we, we um, already know we're black. We know why you're asking. We're happy. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> you do. Yeah, you throw me a bone. This is what I'm going to say. I am 25% Japanese. Anybody who's listening. Uh, so boom. Anyway, uh, you made it clear to me that I have misunderstood his ethnic background. And I don't like being pigeonholed, bro. That's right. And he has he has corrected me. So you know, there you go. You're pretty racist. Uh, but anyway, um, no, no, I am not. <laughs> yeah, he's, like, he's like anything but that. You know, I, I want to talk about uh, the vineyard stuff with you and, and the intentionality and multi-ethnic. We'll do that in the next next time we do this, which we need to do soon. But I, I want to, uh, uh, you said something earlier about liberation theology and you were talking about your whole story and how, um, you know, like if the church is not actively engaged in its local community to make a difference, I'll just summarize it that way. Um, would you share with our listeners and viewers some of the things that your church has done um, that have been actively engaged in that? Because it's amazing, beautiful. And I know, I hope you're proud of it. And I think you are because it, the story is so powerful. So really quickly, share share with us. Okay. I, I don't know that I'll be able to be quick because I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm here all day. I yeah. just was respecting your time. So go for oh, it. Right, fine. It's just the kids. They have chores to do and they're trying to vacuum while I'm recording. And I, I just don't want that. That's all. Uh, which now means I'll have to do the chores. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so let me preface all of this to say we have primarily done a lot of this work with our money. And so I feel like it's important for that distinction because I have a new pastor, um, um, who's on my team. And, and as she's come into our story, she's hearing our story through a different lens than the story we tell, right? So we tell a version of the story and then she's seeing the story. And one of the critiques that she's had, which I think has been super helpful, is that we do a lot with our money. Mm. We don't do as much with our physicality. And so I'll, I'll distinguish that as I sort of tell these stories. So historically, um, we've had compassion in uh, ministries, right? So pretty much every vineyard has a ministry to the poor. And um, I think that it, it, the lore of that is John Wimber is raised by a, a single mom. And so he tells the story of in, in vineyard churches, always remember the poor. Okay. Um, and so we, we got started in Milan, which is a, um, a rural community about 10, 15 miles south of Ann Arbor, where our church sort of exploded up to 800. And then uh, in there, we had a compassion um, um, ministry and it was just free food. We would buy all the food and we'd just give it away for free. And I mean, just, it's just good stories, right? People walking in with all their paperwork to prove that they need food and clothing and fellowship. And we're all like, put your documentation away. We're not getting money from the government. So we don't need to prove that you have a need. If you have a need, we believe you and we're going to feed you. And, and, and that ministry continues today, even though the church, our church, which started it and then handed it off to another church, that church closed, but the ministry still continues. And it is the num it's the largest distributor of free food in the Southern part of our County. Wow. And that's something we're really, really hugely um, proud of. But, you know, we're fought, we're chasing everybody else. Right. You know, you got um, down in uh, what's his name? Michael. Michael's doing that down in Florida. I'm sure you're doing it where you are in Red Buff. I mean, you were talking about, well, you did something with the fires. I saw you. Yeah, carry we, 
we put the fires. We, we try to do stuff, but I mean, your guys' stuff is like, I'm always, this is no joke. Every time I see one of the things your church does, I was like, well, geez, why don't you just, <laughs> I can't so, compete with that. So, so we've been doing that for almost 25 years, you know, so it's wow. a long, long time. Yeah. We've, we've yeah. just given out a lot of food. Um, and it's just a great thing to do. Um, uh, when we came to Ann Arbor, we tried to do the same thing. And uh, we bagged up food. We took it to the local trailer park. They looked at us like, you all have lost your ever-loving mind. Don't ever come to our house again. Mm -hmm. So we realized, okay, this ministry doesn't translate. Go ahead. You were going to say something. No, I was just saying, I, I've been in that, like, you're trying to be like all, oh, we're going to bless you. And they're like, we don't want your blessing. And I'm like, oh, yeah. sorry. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so we learned. And so then that group of people... Um, realized that we had homeless people living under underpasses in um, uh, in town. And so they got our church van, drove over, and said, what do you need? And they were like, we need tents, kerosene lamps, and we need food. And so that was the start of our homeless ministry in Ann Arbor. And so um, that was like 15 years ago. And so we took all those resources to where they were. Mm -hmm. um, and we coupled it with advocacy. Okay. So we were doing direct aid, but advocacy for affordable housing. One of the things we learned and I learned it, cause I talked to the leader of this group because it became a collective of homeless folks. And I was like, if we can get you housing, do you want to move into it? He's like, no, I just want to live outdoors right now. And that was just something I, I was like, it is cold. It is yeah. really here in Michigan, you know, last night it was negative six. Okay. <laughs> and we don't want people dying, you know, um, type of thing, but there's something about people's uh, agency that this kind of ministry has taught me to respect is that I don't know what's best for someone. All I know is I want to be open to what the Holy spirit is asking me to do. And can I partner with them? So then that ministry moved from us driving around because it got really big to us centralizing it into a downtown park. So at fifth and um, division, we uh, Liberty, actually Liberty and division. That's the corner. Yeah, got it. Liberty division. Mm -hmm. I did. Right, right yeah. on that corner is Michigan. where we do, yeah, where we do our, <laughs> where we do our, our, our Friday night outreach. And uh, we just made that free to anybody. So if you're just downtown and you want food, we, we give out pizza, coffee, hot chocolate and prayer. And we've been doing that every Friday, haven't missed a Friday um, for over 12, 13 years. We got um, ridiculed by the Homeless Association of our community. So the director of the Homeless Association said the money that the vineyard is spending on that food program would be better spent if they gave it to us. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what does that sound like? I call that politics. That right there is politics. But let me tell you what we did. One, we didn't defend ourselves, right? So we just want to hear the critique because sometimes mm -hmm. like, we want to do the right thing, but there are people whose lives and jobs it, uh, it is to do this work. And they might say, look, we know better, okay? And then what happened is the, it was in the paper and all of the comments, I mean, hundreds, I'll send you a link just so you can throw it into your show notes or something. So people, yeah, that'd be great. You could see the comments of the community like railing against the uh, the the shelter association. So any day that, yeah, and, and Ann Arbor is a progressive left-leaning city. It is not a, we love churches. They're like, churches need to pay taxes. That's our yeah. posture. That's yeah, yeah, the posture yeah. of our city. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the idea, the idea that the, the, our community was defending us in that way was really interesting. So here's what we did. We gave $5,000 to the shelter association, which was the budget for the outreach for that year. And we kept doing the outreach. Um, and we did that because we're the shelter association is not our enemy, right? The, the enemy is that in America, not everybody has a guaranteed home. Yeah. That's your enemy. Yeah. And we're going to work together with whoever is willing to work with us. Hold on first. 
we're going to work together with whoever's willing to work with us for the common good. And the common good is helping people have what we think is a human right, which is housing. Everybody deserves to be housed. And so we're not going to have a fight. Then city council changed the rules about giving out because we give out food in a city owned park mm. and the park that we give out in. There's a lot of crime in it because it attracts a lot of different people. And so people are like, well, if the vineyard wasn't attracting people there with the food, then there wouldn't be crime. Right. So some slippery logic, but OK, because <laughs> often it's not our community that we're serving. It's other people. But yeah, in any way, they changed the rules and they made it so that we couldn't uh serve food uh to the community and and the churches have had to had to deal with this all over the country right yeah 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 and again we didn't fight city council um the homeless did they got together went to the city council meetings week after week protesting mm. with signs let the let the vineyard feed us like crazy man <laughs> and then then uh, city council issued a retraction and an apology and said no it was a misunderstanding and we were like, great, we're happy to go back. Um, and so that has been a huge part of what we've done, like physically, like being present. So there's a group of people who lead that, who show up, who do that work. But one of the other things we've done is we've given away our Easter offering. And uh, we do leap of faith. So when, uh, can I say Blue Ocean on this podcast? Is that okay? <laughs> As a non-official representative of any denomination, I want to be very clear about that. You can say whatever you want. Okay. All right. So when, when Blue Ocean was the learning laboratory of the vineyard, I think is how someone described it. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Keep going. It's good. Um, Blue Ocean had this summertime thing um, that, or Lent, Lenten uh, practice called Leap of Faith. And so we, we've adopted it and we keep doing it in our church. And during Leap of Faith, we ask you to identify six people who would um, benefit from some blessing from God and to pray for them and then to blow some money on one of them. And then, you know, do a devotional, get baptized. You know, we have all these practices, okay? Mm hmm yeah. So then we said, well, what if we, what if we blew some money on someone in our community as our Lenten act of faith? And so that turned into a tradition now where we give away our Easter offering. So we gave our oh, first time we did it. Yeah, we gave twenty five thousand away to food gatherers, which is our local food pantry, um, which feeds everybody in our community who's food insecure. The second year we did it, we gave uh, about 20000 to Habitat for Humanity because uh, we helped build two houses for single moms. Uh, the third year we did it, uh, we gave about 18000 You can see the numbers are dropping. 18000 <laughs> away to, <laughs> um, uh, to uh, the Religious Action for Affordable Housing to uh, create transitional housing for people who were coming out of prison so that they wouldn't recommit crimes because one of the big reasons why people recommit is because they don't have housing. And then um, the one that you probably most recently heard about is when we uh, took our Easter offering a couple of years ago, which was about 20, uh, another 20 ish thousand um, and paid off $3 million in medical debt. Yeah. And so just all for, just for what slow down. So for those listening, and for those watching, um, your church took an offering and had about $20,000. And with that $20,000, you were able to buy off, pay uh, over $3 million worth of medical debt that was owed by people in your community. Yes, in, in southeastern Michigan. So we paid off debt across seven counties. Like we bought all the debt in one county. We bought all the debt in another county. And then we bought all the debt in our own county. And then we still had enough money to keep buying debt. So we bought some debt in Wayne County, which is our eastern neighbor county where Detroit is, is in Wayne County. And it was in Wayne County uh, there was a woman who got the letter from us and um, it, it came and cleared her debt. And then she told her story to ABC Nightly News to a producer at ABC Nightly News with Brian Williams or whatever his name is. And then um, his producer called us and said, hey, we found someone who got 
their debt paid off and it was your church. Can we interview you? And can she come to church and speak to your church? And we were like, yes. <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, like- and here, and here was the interesting thing. Cause they wanted to interview someone from our church. And I was like, well, let's let someone else do it. I don't need to do it. And then our team was like, no, 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 you do it. Right. And, and because one of the things that I want to be super careful about with all these things is this is not about, me, right. Yeah. I'm not building Donnell White's ministries. I'm not trying to uh, fund my, my jet. Um, I'm not trying to get my TV uh, ministry off the ground or, or my series of oh, he- self help books. Remember, <laughs> yeah. yes, remember the little people. <laughs> and so, and so it was just really great, man. And I cried like a baby. Oh, I man. cried like a baby on that stage when she told her story of like she she got sick and then she got sick again and then the debts piled up and then she lost her apartment. She had to move into like, with her family and she was about to lose her car or something like that before our notice came. And then the other story that gutted me, I mean, this story, I was on vacation when we did this. It was at the beginning of July. And then I took off because I go away for a whole month in July. And I was up north in Traverse City in this big beach house that my in-laws had rented and, you know, just enjoying the good life. And I get a call from our local newspaper and I do an interview with them. And then um, I get another call and it's a a person who got the notification that we cleared their debt. And it was on the death anniversary to the day of when the person had died, but they still had a debt because their estate still owed that money for the cost to try to save their life or something like that. And, and they got a letter from us telling us that we had, or telling them that we had cleared that debt. And I just, I just, I was just like, if this is not the gospel, Mm -hmm. I don't know what the gospel is. Right. And so then you begin to embody these moments where you understand, like, I think you could read Jesus in one way of like, Jesus puts himself in these like crazy situations so that he can have these countercultural experiences, right? Like the woman who's cleaning his feet with her hair and uh, with her tears. And then you realize, like, these are real human moments of transformation. And that If our gospel presentation doesn't include this, then it's lacking something. It's Mm -hmm. lacking something. And I don't want to be the judge of what it's lacking, right? I I don't stand in the judgment, but I do want to say like that just, it gutted me in a way. And so that has motivated us to, we want to be faithful witnesses. So we started advocating for ending cash bail. And we, we got out and started to advocate for a new county prosecutor who we uh, elected. And the first thing he did was in cash bail. So people in our county now, and we're the only county in the state of Michigan where the prosecutor won't see cash bail. And that's a partnership between the community and the church. That's not that's not just progressive politics. Like he, he met with me because he wanted to meet with me because he sees – church leaders as influencers. And he's like, I want you to help tell this story because he sees these stories as linked and tied together. Right. And what's at the core of all of this, it's liberation. Right. Mm. And and so then I got on his uh, racial equity team. And so we're now changing the way law enforcement uh, works. Mm. So if you get pulled over for law enforcement because you didn't signal, well, this prosecutor is not going to charge you And if anything happens as a result of that, the charges are going to get dismissed. Why? Because we know in a racialized system that police are acting in good faith with the law that they've been provided, but it has uh, often negative and sometimes intended negative consequences. And so now he's kicking that. He's doing a lot of progressive stuff. And our church is like at the center of that kind of partnership. And this is what I'll say, because I know we've gone way, way, way over time. 
But right now I'm like working with his office on warrant resolution. And this is something that every church in every jurisdiction in the United States can pick up because there are people who are incarcerated right now because of an outstanding warrant that's usually somewhere between 50 and about $250. Hmm. And as a church, you could get together with 10 churches, work with your public defender and your county prosecutor and do what we're gonna be doing, which is a warrant resolution day to say, let's kick these warrants so that people get decarcerated which is, you know, we sing, what's that song? Uh, you know, the, the, the prisoners go free, right? There's, there's some kind of hill song, song yeah. that is- You don't mean is, that, though, just, so you, just I see, want there you. you go. There you go, Luke. Like Sunday morning, <laughs> we're, we're like praying, singing with everything in our being. God, open the prison doors, set mm. the captives free. And the Holy Spirit it's, is, uh, hold, yeah. hold on, hold on. The Holy mm. Spirit is like, if I could just talk to you for just a second, you're like, no, because we're worshiping you. And the Holy Spirit is just like, if I could just get your attention for a second, no, we need your power to come. And the Holy Spirit is just like, I'm already here. What do you need? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because you're like, duly noted. <laughs> That's true. I, I mean, like we we I think about that all the time about we sing, we sing these songs and we have these words that are so powerful and yet they stop. <laughs> At 12. They stop at 12. No, we, no, no, that's not fair, Luke. That's not fair. Okay. Because, sorry. because of Spotify and Apple Music, we can continue <laughs> to you. listen to them. We can bring them to <laughs> our devotional time. We can go on walks. A very small with section of my day, Donnell. Uh, you're but, right. Yeah, I, so that, that just I blew me away. Sure. Like, yeah, I, that's amazing. I, 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 I was thinking about that song. And I was like, I, I heard it a, again with fresh ears. And I was like, wow, I am singing. We are singing, set the captives free. And just uh, four blocks from here, there are 500 people who are in, in detention. Yeah. And what does, it, what does it look like for the church to say, the gospel compels me, right? I know the quote that is misattributed to St. Augustine, preach the gospel always and where necessary use words. He, he never actually said that, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or to to Augustine or to uh, Fra St. Francis of Assisi. And, Assisi. Yeah, and, Neither. They never, and they never said it. And, yeah. and, and I'll give you, I'll back it up with documentation. I'll send you because someone actually tried to find the quote and they couldn't find it. Okay? Yeah, it, it, I, I know every scholar is like, uh, no. no, it doesn't exist. But mm -hmm. There is a disconnect that I think uh, happens. And and I want to give credit to Jim Poole uh, because anything you like about us, not to, not to diminish what we're doing because we are actually doing it, but I feel like Jim Poole has been my torchbearer. Like, I mean, dude, dude, like makes me look like a lightweight. So he is <laughs> incarnational ministry. Truly. He is like I, nobody does translocal better than him. Man. I, no, I, 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 I don't, just know, no. I don't know Jim very well, but every time I see or hear anything he's doing, I'm like, that's so smart. That's so well. And, and the other thing that we do, which I think is worth noting, is we're the only church in our entire county of 400,000 people who serve Thanksgiving dinner on Thanksgiving Day to anybody who wants to get a meal. Yeah. Our church in Wisconsin used to do that, and it was one of the most powerful things we did all year long for so, many, re so many reasons. Yeah, yeah. and we did, it, we did it in COVID. We went down to the Shelter Association, and we did it. And here's the thing that blows me away. Every year, the local uh, NPR station calls and says, hey, pastor, are you doing the Thanksgiving dinner? And I go, we sure are. He goes, good. That sounded almost like. No, no, no. He, he, he's a, he's a, he's a, a, a third culture guy. So he, uh, I wouldn't even try his accent, but, but he calls every year and I'm, I'm blown away. And I, every time I talk about it, people will like, they'll remark about it. And I was like, let me tell you, our number one volunteer thing that we do is that Thanksgiving meal. When we tell people we're doing that, we get hundreds of people outside of our community 
who show up, whole families show up. And that just told me something, right? Like a friend of mine says, a lot of Christians have issues with Halloween, but Halloween is one of those uh, times where everybody's outdoors, everybody mm -hmm. is having a great time. Like, why wouldn't you spend time with your neighbors over Seriously. Halloween, right? Yeah. Like, and as much as I'm not a fan of the focus on the family world, okay, like that's just not my world. Yeah. There was a book they put out a long time ago called Redeeming Halloween. And it, yeah. in, uh, in, I don't I didn't even read it, but I just like love the idea that they were considering that Halloween could be a missional context. Um, or just you know. being incarnational with your oh. neighbors, right? Well, like just I just want to go get that candy. Yes, okay. and you should have the best candy. If Why you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to tell people you're a Christian, you should yeah. give out the king size, right? Like, where is the and generosity of God? You do. I'm going to be your God yeah. in the king size candy. So we'll, yeah. it, I'll, I'll give it to you there. And then Amen. there's if we ever get on the call again, because I know now you'll never have me on because it's like no. two podcast episodes uh no. i'll tell you about some of the other things that we're up to because we're even we're doing more than whatever okay. i so, need to now let's do this um first of all uh as i have said numerous times in my podcast i normally talk about the intersection between ecclesiology pneumatology missiology and sacramentality but okay. i also say i can talk about whatever i want because <laughs> i pay bills well and, we did we did ecclesiology. Uh, we talked care. about the Holy Spirit. We did pneumology. I, All right, what else is in your I'm, list? I'm a fan, Donnell. Like, I, what I need you to understand right now is I'm a fan. Like, I'm I appreciate you. I missiology. Yep, we we did I, missiology. I, what else is in your list? I don't understand why you're checking off boxes. Those are my boxes. They're not even on the. But I but I do. I really appreciate you. And uh, for real, um, I would love to have you on as a regular. Yeah. Um, part of this uh, podcast because I, I just there's so many things that I um, am fascinated by your thinking and I, I've benefited from it and I really do want to encourage everybody uh, if you are listening you can't see our little video but Donnell's on Twitter it's at Donnell that's, that's it D-O-N-N-E-L-L -E -L. And, and my name's Celtic so there you go it's uh so it should be pronounced completely different than the way it sounds then. Cause every Celtic thing I've ever seen, I'm like, uh, -uh. uh, yes. but Hey, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, is there anything else that like people can, uh, uh, you have papers on, uh, on a website, uh, you know, how can people connect with yeah, you? I mean, I think that that's been a question that a lot of people have asked me and I've been negligent here. Um, so I yes. would say, <laughs> I would say uh, follow our sermon podcast, um, mm -hmm. which is just Ann at vineyard.org. Uh, we're on uh, Spotify, iTunes, Google, or your favorite um, podcatcher. Uh, so you can go to our website and get that. Uh, Missio Alliance is creating a new writers collective that they've invited me to participate in. And so right. I will probably be writing a few more artic articles uh, over there. Um, mm -hmm. If you do follow me on Twitter, I just want to warn you, I'm my full self. So the id is on Twitter. Uh, if you want my Very Christian. Angry. He's always angry. He's I'm just not flaming. angry. I'm not angry. That, that's racist. That was racist. You know. <laughs> no, it's not the black. Hey, Come on. It's not the black. <laughs> White uh, people. You too. White people have been very angry this year. I'm White people always angry on Twitter. I actually was going to say. The U.S. government this year. They were quite angry. Twitter, <laughs> I, 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 that's funny that you say that. That Twitter is the one place that I feel like I can be honest 100%. And exactly. uh, every I, angry. Yeah. Yes, it's like. Yeah, I, I usually say Twitter is like. I, I swear on Twitter. So if 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 a pastor using swear words is more than you can manage, uh, follow me on Facebook. And on Facebook, I post um, cooking um, uh, recipes and tips and race. So it's cooking and race. So I'll make something really delicious, and then I'll have a race uh, commentary about it. <laughs> You never have cat memes though, because cat memes is no, what I, I always I don't like do. any cats. So oh. I've lost a half your audience, I'm sure. Hey. I, well, yeah. I wasn't a cat guy until my wife introduced me to the fact that I am going to have two cats and now I've become a cat <laughs> guy. A cat guy. Yeah, I had no choice. Uh no, on a on a serious level, Donnell, um, I really do appreciate your your voice. Um, and speaking as you know, just as a vineyard pastor, I know many other vineyard pastors who really appreciate you. 
Um, and it really is an honor to know you and to be able to learn from you and then have you on the podcast too. So uh, you did not go too long. You shared so many really great things. I, I, I always want to have like these really long conversations. And some people I've interviewed, they're like, I've got 35 minutes. And I'm like, oh. Okay. Yeah, anyway. I know. we were just warming up at 35 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everybody who tuned in, listen. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna be back again soon. Um, you can uh, leave a review if this was helpful for you, um, and stay tuned. Donnell, thank you again, and we'll check we'll check everybody else later. Woo!